of years ago, I ran a, uh, a training course in evangelism. It was called Outgoing. It was about uh, knowing our outgoing God and becoming an outgoing people. And uh, it was a 12-week course. And uh, each session was two hours long. And that, that's quite a lot of material, isn't it? Um, uh, William Booth used to say that uh, the best evangelism training would be a day trip to hell. Um, I gave them 24 hours with me. Uh, and uh, there was one church leader in Eastbourne, and uh, he came to me, and uh, he said, well, listen, I, I don't have 24 hours to spend, Glenn. Can you, can you boil it down to two things? What two things are there uh, that you would say we're not quite understanding that if we understood them, we could go out and tell good news. What are, what are the two things? From our conversation, I was aware that he thought the answers would be something like, uh, God is big, hell is hot. Life is short, eternity is long. Uh, Jesus has ordered us, let's just go. I, I, I thought that those were the sorts of things he was expecting me to say. What are the two things that we're not understanding uh, that would make us better evangelists. And I said, well, the, the two things are probably, uh, we don't know who God is, and we don't know what salvation is. Apart from that, we're golden. Apart from that, it's all A-OK. -okay. But Christians, Christians do not know who God is. Christians do not know what salvation is. When we understand who our God is, when we understand what His salvation is, then perhaps we can speak the gospel to others. But if we do not understand those things, we must not turn people into evangelists who don't know who God is and who don't know what salvation is. Uh, in Matthew 23, verse 15, Jesus is in the middle of talking to the Pharisees, the hypocrites, and he says in verse 15, you guys are great evangelists. You're wonderful evangelists. You're very committed evangelists. You're very devoted evangelists. In one sense, you are very biblical evangelists. And you, tr you travel across land and sea to win a single convert. And when you make a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. Okay? Now, question. Does the world need more evangelists? That depends, doesn't it? It totally depends on what is the evangel that's being spoken. What is the good news that's being spoken? Because whatever the evangelist believes, that belief will get photocopied. That belief will get multiplied and exponentially will reach out into the world and if you are a son of hell, you'll reproduce sons of hell. If you don't understand the gospel properly, you will just multiply that error out through the world. The other verse in Matthew uh, that, I, that I love when speaking about evangelism is, is Matthew 12, verse 34. If Matthew 23, 15 is bad evangelism, Matthew 12, verse 34, Jesus says, Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That is a truth for good or for evil. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth does speak. What do we need? Do we need more evangelists? That depends. That depends on what, what is the gospel we are filling our heads and our hearts with. Because whatever we fill our heads and hearts with, that will be the gospel that we go and tell to others. I was... Um, I was working at a church, actually, that, from which Christianity Explored came. Uh, in the year 2000, I, I worked at uh, All Souls Langham Place, where, where Ian, Ian was, in one sense, my boss, sort of up the, up the chain. I didn't directly report to him, which was good. <laughs> We're both happy about that. No. Um, uh, my job was essentially to clean a thousand toilets in a year. Um, but I also got to meet wonderful people, um, like, like Ian, like, uh, like John Stott. Um, you, you could have lunch with John Stott and that kind of thing. You'd wash your hands first and then have lunch with John Stott and ask all sorts of questions. But uh, I was, uh, I've always been very much into uh, street preaching, evangelism uh, in the open air. 
And uh, I used to join a group that went out on a Thursday night um, into the middle of London to speak about Jesus. And uh, one time a friend of mine heard my preaching. And they came to me and they said, Glenn, there's something else that we do on a Thursday night. It's a theology course. Uh, would you like to stop preaching just for a bit and perhaps go to the theology course and figure out what the gospel is? <laughs> and I said, I already know the gospel. Other people need the gospel, so I will tell the gospel to other people. I already know it. I don't need to know it. I just need to speak it to other people. And uh, he, he just left my answer hanging in the air like a bad smell. And he said, no, Glenn, I think you need to come. And, and I went along to this course, and, and it was a very deep theological course. And, and, and I remember sitting through it thinking, maybe I don't know the gospel. And, and maybe that's still true today. Do I know the gospel? Yes and no. Uh, yes, I know Jesus is Lord. Yes, I know, as we'll see, uh, a lot about the gospel. But, but don't I need to hear the gospel? Don't I need to be re-evangelized again and again? Don't I need to use the gospel again on my heart over and over and over again so that what overflows from my mouth might actually be the true gospel? So I went to this course and I, I was listening to who is God's and what is salvation. And I was realizing that in my street preaching on a Thursday night, sometimes I was giving people the bread of life, and sometimes I was giving people sort of sawdust, or a stone, or a block of wood. But I put some, I put some really good chili sauce on it to give it some kick, yeah? But it wasn't the bread of life, it really wasn't. What do we need? What do we need to, 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 to know in order to be better evangelists? A friend of mine said, uh, said to me, if we're having trouble re-evangelizing Europe, if we are having trouble, there can only be two problems. Either we've got the gospel wrong, or we've got our methods wrong. And then my friend said, we definitely haven't got the gospel wrong, so what we need to do is concentrate on our methods. I could not disagree with him more. Could not disagree with him more. Uh, let's not just become pragmatists, about a gospel that is not really good news. Let's think theologically, let's think biblically, let's think Christ-centeredly about what the good news is, and then perhaps that will then overflow into our methodology, but it will overflow into what we say as well. Let's concentrate on what the gospel is. So with that in mind, um, a couple of years ago I, I came up with um, a gospel presentation uh, called 321, the story of God, the world, and you. And uh, I thought what I'd do is show you a video of that, and you can have a look at uh, this presentation in about five minutes. And then I'll just sort of talk you through it and why I think each of these three points, three and two and one, are so vital for the gospel, and they're so vital for gospeling. So let's, uh, let's have a look at the video. So um, you'll see there are three points to it. Uh, under three... God is three persons united in love. So we, we start with who is God and the most foundational truth, obviously, all throughout church history, you ask people what is the most foundational truth about God and they always say Father, Son and Holy Spirit united in love. That's, that's always what the church has answered really in, in, in terms of the most foundational truth about who God is. We'll think about why that's absolutely vital in a second. Uh, second truth over the page, the world is shaped by two representatives. Adam and Christ. And Adam, our first father, plunges us down into death and curse and alienation from God. Jesus is the second Adam who grabs humanity by the scruff of the neck, takes us onto himself, takes us through that death that we deserve, through that alienation from God that we deserve, takes us through that, rises up again to new life, and sits enthroned as Lord of the world. So that's the two Adam takes us down, Jesus raises us up. And then the final truth, one, you are born one with Adam, united to Adam, you're born one with Adam, be one with Jesus. There is the offer, the offer to be united to Jesus. Maybe like a, a bride is united to her husband, 
maybe like a, uh, a branch of the vine is united to the vine, be one with Jesus. And of course, once you are one with Jesus, then you have his father as your father, you have his spirit as your spirit, you have his eternal future as your future, all because you are one with Jesus. And that's where sort of the, the beauty of the truth of adoption um, that you were speaking of, about sort of comes in. The gospel is about God, the world, and yourself. About God, God is three persons united in love. About the world, it's been shaped by these two representatives. And about yourself, you're either one with Adam, and then the gospel is be one with Jesus. So why do we start with three? Why do we start with uh, this truth about Trinity? Uh, I was at, at a conference uh, for evangelists in London uh, last year, and uh, one of the seminar streams had about 40 evangelists in it, um, and Rico was one of them, and he was there, and uh, another guy called Mike Reeves was there. Has anybody re read Mike Reeves' book, The Good God? Yes. Um, it's called Delighting in the Trinity in the American version. In the bookstore, it's called Delighting in the Trinity because they've got the American version. Get it. Get it. Get it, get it this week. Um, he was there taking a seminar on why our gospel presentations need to be Trinitarian. And, and Rico and I were, were reflecting after this seminar that nobody else in the room seemed to understand why our gospel presentations need to be Trinitarian. And in fact, the more you spoke to, to, to these evangelists, the less clear they were on what the doctrine of the Trinity was or why it was important. And that, that really bugged me because I started asking questions of these other evangelists. I said, when you say God came to earth as Jesus, okay, let's, let's, let's imagine that that's your gospel presentation. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Okay, we must affirm that. We must affirm that. But, but then don't you, don't you say, and then Jesus uh, pays the penalty of sin to God or, or suffers the, the, the punishment at God's hands on the cross. And don't non-Christians come up to you afterwards and say, what? Is he God or is he the son of God? You said both. You said he's God, but he's praying to God. What's, what's that all about? Don't you get people all the time asking how this Trinity thing works? So if you're not explicit about it in your talk, surely people ask you about it later. And actually, most of these evangelists said that they, they never got asked those kinds of questions. I cannot believe that. I cannot believe that you can preach Jesus without people asking those questions. You might preach about some abstract God, but you, how can you preach on Jesus and not be asked these kinds of questions? Because it is of the very essence of the gospel that he is fully God, but it is of the very essence of, of the gospel that he is the son of the father who brings us into his sonship. It's the very essence of the gospel. We had a look at Mark chapter 1 verse 1 earlier. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He is, who is Jesus? He is the Christ, the son of God. And in fact, you, you go through the New Testament and you ask the question, what is the most basic foundational descriptor of Jesus? What is, what is the most foundational thing that the New Testament says about Jesus? He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. Mark's gospel begins with it. Matthew and Luke begin with it in, the, in, the, in terms of the baptism. John's gospel is structured around it. In John chapter 20, he says, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, that's the most foundational thing about who is Jesus. He is the Christ, the Son of God. But what does that mean? He is anointed with the Spirit. He is Son of the Father. And you cannot know Jesus without knowing three. You just can't. And you cannot articulate Jesus' identity without the three. You cannot which is why when the early church was putting together the creeds, they were being good evangelists. Here were people who wanted to spread the good news, and they were encountering lots of questions. Is Jesus God, or is he the Son of God? How does that make sense? And the doctrine of the Trinity is just the articulation of the identity of Jesus. Okay? And we must get the which God question right. We must get the witch god question right. Uh, 
let's uh, have a look at uh, Colossians 1 verse 15. Colossians 1 verse 15. This is so vital. Okay, Colossians 1 verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Which means Jesus is the one who is on show, the image. God is the one who is unknown. The Father is invisible and unknowable apart from Christ. We often think it's the other way around, don't we? If, uh, if you, certainly if you survey people in England and you ask them, do you believe in God? A majority will say, yes, I believe in God. If you ask them, who do you think Jesus is? You will get any kind of view. Maybe he was a myth. Maybe he was just a great teacher. Maybe he was a prophet. Maybe he was just a, a nice guy. Who is Jesus? We don't know who Jesus is but the culture kind of thinks it knows who God is. And in fact, even a culture that has rejected God, it thinks it knows the God it has rejected. I love the story of uh, Tom Wright, uh, who was uh, chaplain at, a, at an Oxford college. And uh, at this college, students would, uh, would come and uh, they would have to spend 10, 15 minutes with the chaplain. Whether they believed in God or not, they had to spend 15 minutes with the chaplain, which could be awkward if you're an agnostic, if you're an atheist. What do you say and what does the chaplain say to you? Tom Wright said lots of, lots of young students would be very uh, shy and then they would say, I'm, I'm sorry, actually, chaplain, I, I don't actually believe in God. And Tom Wright had a brilliant response. He said, which God don't you believe in? Which God don't you believe in? And, and the student was, well, just, you know, God. The big guy, God, you know, that, that sort of head teacher, headmaster, kind of high on power, low on personality, that, that guy, I don't believe in him. And, and Tom Wright would, would say, oh, you're absolutely right. Let me affirm you in your athe atheism. I don't believe in that God either. Let me tell you about Jesus. And he's able to do that because of verses like Colossians 1 verse 15. He is, Christ is the image of an otherwise invisible God. We need to be asking the which God question so much more in evangelism. Can you imagine Elijah in the Old Testament walking around and, and trying to win people to the God of Israel? And can you imagine him going, uh, doing a tour of the nations and encountering people from different, different uh, nations? And, and he says, do you believe in God? And the, and the person from, from Babylon or Assyria says, yes, I believe in God. Can you imagine Elijah saying, oh, phew, that's good. Great. I'm so glad you believe in God. Is that what he'd say? Nonsense. He'd say, which God? Which God do you believe in? Which God don't you believe in? In evangelism, we think when we meet an atheist that we are at a double disadvantage. We think, if we meet someone who believes in God, we think, Phew, that's half the job done. <gasps> Thank goodness they believe in some kind of God. Now, all I've got to do is convince them that this Jesus guy is the God they've already believed in. And that's how our, our evangelism unfolds all the time. Do you believe in God? Yes. Great. Okay, so we've got God sorted. Brilliant. Now let me introduce you to Jesus. And now, and, and, and then if, if, if you do it like that, you open up the Gospels with people and they see Jesus and he's laughing and he's crying and he's shouting and he's bleeding and he's suffering and he's serving and he's dying. And they say, this guy looks really interesting. And then instead of us saying, yes, and he is the image of the invisible God, forget that old God. Forget that old, look, look through him to see who God is. Instead of saying that, we say, ah, yes, this Jesus who's so interesting, actually, he is that headmaster teacher in the sky. And, and, we, and we try to, do, do you know the, the myth of Procrustes? If you, if you, in, in Greek mythology, if you, if you stayed at the house of Procrustes, he had a bed that was one size. And if you were too tall for the bed, what did he do? He chopped off your feet, okay? 
and he, he tried to fit you to the bed. And, and we do this, we do this with God. We, we imagine we know who God is, and then we bring Jesus in, and we try to cut Jesus down to the size of this, this other God, who's not really God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. But once we see who, once we, once we discover who God is in Jesus, well, he introduces us to his Father, he introduces us to his Spirit, and we know the truth of three. If we don't preach three, here are some things we get wrong. If we don't preach three, we get God wrong. That would be a shame in evangelism, wouldn't it? If we get God wrong, happens. Happens all the time. We get God wrong, we get Jesus wrong. If Jesus is the Son of the Father, full of the Spirit, then we can't understand his identity without understanding it as a Trinitarian identity. If we don't preach three, we get the cross wrong. You see, Jesus is the Son of the Father who has come from the ultimate family. And he comes down into our world to take responsibility for us, to take responsibility for all our sin and failure, and to, to, to take that to the hellish death that it deserves and to rise up again. And so what you see there is that God in Christ is reconciling the world to himself. When you don't see it like that, then Jesus is this third party who comes in between God and us. There's a God up there, there's a humanity over here, and he, here's Jesus as a third party. And then it begins to look really unfair. Why does God zap Jesus with judgment when that judgment's meant for us? How is that fair? Now, John Stott, in his great book, The Cross of Christ, he said that all the misunderstandings of the cross come from a failure to understand three, a failure to understand trinity. Because if you don't understand that Jesus is the Son of the Father, full of the Spirit, you start to think of him as this, this third party. And then, you, and then the cross, the doctrine that Jesus bears our punishment in his body, that, that, that doctrine starts to sound really cruel, really nasty, and we're not too sure we like this God. Uh, we, must, we must preach three because we must get the cross wrong. And of course, if we don't preach three, we get the gospel wrong. A gospel that begins simply with a single power, how will that gospel finish? If it begins with simply a power, an individual power, how must that gospel finish? It must finish with you and I bowing, submitting. What other relationship can you have to a God who is defined simply by being alone, and defined by power. What relationship can you have? The only relationship you can have is to submit to this God. And of course, you know, Islam means submission, right? Why does, is, why, why, why does Islam take the shape that it does? Because of its God. Because of its God. Allah is alone. No one can share in his glory. The only relationship you can have with this Allah is to bow before him. What if, what if you begin with three? What if you begin with three persons united in love? Well, well then there is room in this God to, to come in, to come in alongside. And yes, yes, we bow before the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, we submit to his rule in our life. But that's not the fullness of the gospel, is it? The fullness of the gospel is adoption into this God's life to be filled with this Spirit, to be united to this Son, to be brought before this Father. That's, that's the punchline of our gospel, isn't it? The punchline of our gospel is not simply bow to a power who is over you, is it? That's, that's, that's not the end point. The end point of our gospel is be invited into this God who is love, right? And that will involve all sorts of submission to the Lordship of Christ. We'll see that when we get to the truth of one. But the end point is adoption into this God's life. If we don't preach three, we're not going to get there. Anyone want to ask questions at this stage? Thank you. Good question. So how, how do we make people understand the Trinity? I think so much of the problem 
is that we begin with the God that people think they already know. And we, so we assume that people already know who God is, and now Trinity is just an extra detail to teach them about this God they think they already know. So they already think that God's oneness is a power on high, alone, and individual. And then the Christian says, oh, yes, that's true. <laughs> and there's this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit thing. And I think our big problem is we try to unite the, the, the individual God of our own imagination. We try to unite that God to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whereas, if you just begin and say, Father, the Father loves His Son in the joy of the Holy Spirit, that's who the one God is. Before there were, and what I say in evangelism, I say, before there was a world... Can you imagine rewinding history before there were planets, before there were people, before there were protons? Can you imagine what was there in the beginning? And the Bible says in the beginning there was a father loving his son in the joy of the Spirit. Three persons united in love. And that's where the oneness of God comes in. The father is in his son by the Spirit. The son is in his father by the Spirit in a relationship of, of real, a, a relationship of, of, of being that is, that is one, but it is a relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit. I think the problem comes when people say, okay, there's the Father, Son, and Spirit thing, but there's also this other God that we've got to kind of match that up with. There is no God apart from a Father loving His Son in the joy of the Spirit. And I find that non when, you, when you begin there, Non-Christians say, I've never have thought that before. That's weird. That's strange. But everything is strange that we tell them. And what, what I'm making a plea for is don't begin with what they think they already know. Say to them, I know you thought God was a single power in the sky. I know you thought that. Let me tell you about a, a different God. Let me tell you about this God who is three persons united in love. And at that stage, the non-Christian says, that's strange, but I, I understand that as a phrase, three persons united in love. I understand that as a phrase. I don't believe it yet, but then they don't believe anything that we tell them. We say God is love. 1 John 4 verse 8, God is love. That cannot be true without three. A God who is just by himself does not love. If he just loves himself, that's not really love. That's egotism, you know. He's, he's the eternal narcissist. You know, that's, that's not love. And I, I, I said this to a, a Jehovah's Witness two weeks ago. Um, he had never heard this before. He had never, he had never considered that he cannot say that Jehovah is love. He cannot say that Jehovah is love. Because, I mean, he, 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 he mentioned to me 1 John 4 verse 8. He said, well, God is love. I said, but how is your God love? Before there is a universe, who is he loving? And then he said, well, he creates Jesus, and then he loves Jesus. I said, wow, then. So love is not the foundational truth about your God at all, is it? Simply his aloneness, his power to do whatever he will, that is what is ultimate. Love comes later. And he might choose to create Jesus, you know, that's what they believe. He might choose to create Jesus, he might choose to create a world, and he might choose to love that world, but he might not as well. Because what is most true about Jehovah is his aloneness, not his love. He'd never heard that before. He said he'd, he'd go, go away and think about it, and I told him to go and watch 3, 2, 1. But, um, so I, I would just do exactly what you say in, in terms of the Father loving His Son in the joy of the Holy Spirit. This God is an outgoing movement of love, and you're invited in. Um, but it does involve saying to them, listen, that, that individual God who is simply alone, that's not really God. Unfortunately, that is the God that the West has either believed in or rejected. Listen, I never use the word Trinity in evangelism, or very rarely. You don't have to use the word. It's not in the Bible. You don't have to use the word. 
But you do have to have this understanding of who is Jesus, who is his father. You have to have this understanding. The, the way I love to do it is to teach the baptism, the baptism of Jesus. And every, every gospel does it, so there might be something to this, that Jesus' introduction into the world is at the baptism. And what do you see at the baptism? You've got the Jordan River, and I say to people, look, the Jordan River here is the failure's convention. Because everybody is coming to confess their sins. They're all saying, I'm a failure. They're all saying, I'm filthy because I need to be washed. They're all saying, I'm fruitless. John the Baptist, when he preaches in, in Matthew chapter 3, he's always talking about the, the fruitlessness of people. So here they are. They're at the Jordan River. It's the failure's convention. Everybody in the queue is saying, I am failed. I am filthy. I am fruitless. And then who should show up to the failure's convention? The Son of God. And what does he do? He comes to the front of the queue and he goes down into the waters. What's he, it's, what's he doing? This is a marketing nightmare for Team Jesus. You know, how does it look? It looks like he's failed. It looks like he's filthy. It looks like he's fruitless. What is he doing? Well, then I, I say to people, there was an ancient prophecy. 700 years earlier, Isaiah said, when he comes, he will be numbered with the transgressors. Or you could say that he would be counted with the failures. Yeah? And this is what Jesus is doing. He joins us in our failure so we can join him in his family. And, and that's, I, I just keep preaching that everywhere. He joins us, the Son of God joins us in our failure so we can join him in his family. And then I say, what's his family? Well, what happens? Jesus comes up out of the water. The Spirit descends on him as a dove. The Father says, you are my child. You are my son who I love. With you, I am well pleased. That's the family. That's the family that you are made for. That's the family that was there before the world began. That's the family that gave birth to the world in a way. That's, that's, that's the family where you will find yourself. So what do you need to do? What do you need to do? Well, you need to join the queue, don't you? Come to the Failures Convention. We meet every Sunday, <laughs> and we confess our sins, and we, we don't hide it. You know, if Jesus, if Jesus, uh, this, this, this really struck me the other day, it's got nothing to do with evangelism, but if Jesus doesn't mind being seen as a sinner, why do we spend all our time trying to cover up? <laughs> he wasn't a sinner, but he didn't, he didn't mind people thinking he was. He didn't mind joining in at the Failures Convention and getting baptized. <laughs> so the perfect, pure Son of God doesn't mind being seen as a sinner. We sinners, we try to appear like the perfect, pure child of God, don't we? <laughs> Nuts. Ridiculous. But anyway, the gospel is, he joins us in our failure so that we can join him in his family. And if you come to him, you know, the, we'll see with one, the truth of one, we become one with Jesus. It's like standing with him in those waters. Why do we get baptized? Well, to be, it's this symbol of union with Jesus. At the Jordan River, he was united to us and said, I'm standing with you and for you. In our baptism, we come and we confess to our failures and we are one with Jesus. And then we get his father as our father. We get his spirit as our spirit. We get his future as our future, his victory over death and sin and hell. We get that as our victory over death and sin and hell. We get it all because we have Jesus. Now, do you see, when you begin with three, when you've got this understanding of the family, the son coming to be one with you so that you can join the family, don't you see that the, the flavor of that gospel is, is quite attractive? I found that. I found that it's quite attractive to tell people the gospel in these sorts of terms. Um, and we'll see, we'll see why, why that is in, in a second. Anyone got any more questions on three? We'll, we'll move on to two, please. When I talk about two, I'm talking about the world. The story of the world is, is uh, the world is shaped by two representatives. Adam takes us down, Jesus raises us up. And uh, when I do evangelism training, I often ask people to discuss this question. We could, we could do it quite briefly. Um, what do you think is good and what do you think is bad about this definition of the problem? Okay? You and I do bad things and fail to do good things. 
if we don't sort out this sin problem now, we'll be in trouble when we die. Okay? What's good and what's bad about this definition of, of the sin problem? It makes a difference between good and bad. Yes. Good and bad. Yeah, so that's there good. Is such thing as good and bad. Yeah, yeah, so that's good. That's good. And then we sort out what we're doing and then we Yes, we need to sort this out. So that's that's a bad thing about the presentation. Okay. Did you did you have Does that mean you have the fall? No, it doesn't have the fall. No. No. It's it's me by myself. Yeah, have I done good or have I done bad? It's yeah, nothing to do with the fall, actually, is it? Yeah. Did you have some? Yeah, just in the comments, um, on the one hand, it's nice that there's a community of one who just feels bad when you talk about omission of good. Mm. It'd be nice to explain that in a more word as well as action. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's quite a behavioral definition. It's about our actions here, isn't it? It's not really about our being. About our behavior here. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Yeah, exactly. But so often, isn't evangelism, we treat the non Christian as though they are neutral now. And if they choose good, then things will be good in the future. If they choose bad, then things will be bad in the future. But right now, they are neutral. Right now, they, can, they are a, a decision-making you know, individual who has the power to choose good or evil. Um, the, the Bible says we are children of wrath. <laughs> we, we had a look at Ephesians 2 last night, didn't we? Ephesians 2 begins by saying we are children of wrath, children of disobedience. We follow, we follow the, the, the prince of this world. We follow Satan around um, as his slaves. Um, we are bound. We, yeah, we're in bondage. And, and, and so the way you preach, if you think somebody is a decision-making, you know, intellectual decision-making individual, who right now is in a neutral state, the way you will preach to that person is different, isn't it? To if you realize the fall has already happened, <laughs> we're already in the pit. Um, you know, Jesus says in John 3 verse 18 that those who do not believe in his name are condemned already. Condemned already. John 3 verse 36, Jesus says the wrath of God remains on them. Remains on them right now. Romans 1, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. You know? It's, yeah. And this is, this is why, because it doesn't talk about the fall, we're in such difficulty. Because it's, it's almost as if you're, you're treating the non-Christian as though they might, they might fall into the pits. They might. But if they're clever, they can make a good choice and get out of it. The Christian doctrine is that we've fallen. <laughs> we've fallen. But Jesus has, has dived down into the pit with us. You know, that's the gospel. Let's just briefly do um, two. Uh, in, in England, um, a very um, a surprisingly popular program is um, Who Do You Think You Are? And I think it has, it has sort of gone to other countries as well. Do, do, do other people know about this program, Who Do You Think You Are? Famous people do their family tree, their genealogy. They figure out their family history. It's surprisingly popular, actually. Because when we ask the question, who do you think you are today, we tend to answer the question in terms of our actions, in terms of our experiences, in terms of the things that we do. Um, who am I? Certainly in England and in Australia, when you, when you try to figure out who am I, the thing you do is you buy a plane ticket and you fly to Peru and you, you trek the Andes and you have experiences to find out who you are. And you find out who you are through your experiences through your achievements, through the things that you do. This program is surprising, but it's biblical, because it's asking, who am I? I am my family. Now, that's a very frightening truth, isn't it? Depending on your family, but uh, I am, uh, yeah. And, and we know that as we grow older, we, we start to say things exactly the way that our father said things, and it's just, it just freaks us out, doesn't it? 
Um, but it's very biblical. Who are you? You are your family. If I did this program, I would love to look into my great, 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 great grandmother. Uh, she was called Anne Forbes. And in 1787, she stole 10 yards of printed cotton from a London market. And uh, she was sentenced to death, obviously, uh, for her terrible crime. Um, but this was 1787, and they were about to ship the convicts to Australia, the very first fleet. But they had a problem. They realized they had 1,700 men convicts and only about 100 female convicts. And they thought this could prove a problem in the colony of Australia. So, so they commuted a lot of uh, women's sentences um, to transportation, and thankfully, Anne Forbes um, well, you know that her sentence was commuted. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be here. Um, so on that day when her sentence was changed from death to transportation, my life was saved, wasn't it? And the lives of 6,000 other people who have descended from Anne Forbes. Our lives were saved that day. And you can go online, you can find uh, annforbes.com, and you can do your family tree. And there's the 6,000 of us. Um, we were all born in Australia. Why were we born in Australia? Because our ancestor committed one crime, was exiled, and now I was born in Canberra. Did I choose to be born in Canberra? No. Would I have chosen to be born in Canberra if I had the choice? No. <laughs> no, exactly. Who would choose that? And because this is uh, being filmed, I'm not going to say anything about what I choose my family. Um, but we don't choose these things, do we? We just come into I didn't have to pass a test in order to become Australian. You know, that would be a really difficult test to pass. And then there'd be all sorts of rewards for becoming Australian. But I didn't have to. I was just born Australian. And the Bible's doctrine is, is the same. That one man, one crime, one exile, and we've been born far from God. Far from God. That is our status. Um, so, if we had time, we'd, we'd have a look at 1 Corinthians 15. I'll just, I'll just um, mention verses 21 and 22. As in Adam, all die. No, so, for since death came through one man, since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam, all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. You know, this is, this is the story of two. The two representatives. And we find ourselves here. We find ourselves, perhaps in the words of Jesus, we are sort of branches in a bad tree. We are branches in a bad tree producing bad fruit. Or we are members of a dysfunctional family. Yeah? You might think that only your human family is dysfunctional. No, the whole human race is dysfunctional. And when I teach it, I, uh, I talk about our family history, the fact that Adam was disconnected from God. I talk about our family traits, um, things like suspicion. The first thing I teach is, is our suspicion of God. Adam and Eve were suspicious of God. They trusted Satan rather than the, the, than the Lord who had given them everything. They're suspicious of him. That's, that's where the sin comes from. And then they are selfish, grabbing after the fruit just because they want it. And at these points, I sort of start saying, do you find that you're suspicious as well? Do you find that you're suspicious of God? Every Christian in the room knows that, you know, we, we wake up in the morning and we're suspicious of God. Is he really going to provide for me today? Can he really be trusted as a father? Can he? We're all suspicious. We're all selfish, grasping after those things that we think will make us happy. Then we all become slaves. There's slavery. Because you, you identify this one thing. Adam and Eve identified the, the forbidden fruit. But we all identify things in our lives. And if we just have them, everything will be okay, right? Everything will be happy. We'll have life if we have these little things like career, like family, like whatever the achievement is that we're really looking for. This is idolatry that I'm teaching at this point. But as soon as we identify these other things and not the Lord, then we become enslaved. So there's suspicion, there's selfishness, there's slavery. There's self-justification as well. Don't you love in the, in the story of the, the Garden of Eden, uh, the Lord comes along and there are, there are Adam and Eve. And they just play the blame game, don't they? 
You know, he blames her, she blames the snake, and then the snake doesn't have a leg to stand on. You know, it's a, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and, uh, but that's in my heart as well. When I, when I drive, when I drive on the highways, when I drive on the motorway, everyone who drives faster than me is a maniac. And everyone who drives slower than me is an idiot, right? And it's true, isn't it? Like we're, but, but I drive just right, don't I? We're always self-justifying. And then the final S that I teach is stuff-ups. You know, we just, it's incredible. When you teach non-Christians about the Garden of Eden, they always think, how could it go so wrong? Like, they've got everything. They're made for each other. They're kings and queens of all creation. And, you know, and then instantly, it's like there's a gigantic button that says disaster. And Adam and Eve just go, yeah, hit the button, hit the button, hit the button. And, and, but then I say to the non-Christian, but doesn't that describe your life too? Has anybody ruined your life better than you? Has anyone disappointed your own expectations for happiness? better than you? Has anyone sabotaged your own life better than you have? It's baffling, but this, this connects with people. This connects with people. And I sort of start to say, well, we all share these family traits. Maybe that's because we are family, yeah? And if we are family, we're in this position. We've got this history, and we've also got this inheritance coming, death. I teach the, the death in terms of a Christmas tree. You know, imagine a Christmas tree in November, it's happy, it's alive, it's fresh. And then in the name of Christmas joy, we go out into the forest and we hack it to death. We wrench it from its home and we bring it indoors. And the minute you cut it off, it's dead. It doesn't look dead. It looks great. But it's dead. It has no life in it. And it starts to perish. The, the needles, the leaves start to fall. But we don't mind about that. We decorate it with all sorts of, you know, decorations. We surround it by family. We surround it by fun and festivities. But it's dead. It's perishing. And in January, what do we do to it? We just chuck it out. We just chuck it out. The Bible says that's the human condition. We are spiritually dead, disconnected from God, disconnected from our life source. We're perishing. And if that perishing goes on forever, Jesus describes that disconnected state as being shut out of the feast in outer darkness with weeping and wailing and the angry gnashing of teeth. It's a horrible thing. It's perishing eternally. But it makes sense, doesn't it? If you've turned from the God who is life, you've turned into death. If you've turned from the God who is love, you've turned into anger. You have. And that will go on forever in Adam. But... As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Christ comes down into the pit to join us, to be one with us. He takes on himself our sins, our failures, our fruitlessness, our filth. He takes it on himself. He accepts the fiery judgment that it deserves. And he passes through to the other side, to resurrection life. And then we can be one with him. Let me just... Uh, very briefly say why, if we don't preach to, there are problems. If we don't preach to, your hearers will be central. If we don't preach to, the hearer will be this individual who could go left, could go right. They're a decision-making individual, and we put all the power into their hands to make a good choice. The truth of the matter is they are sunk in sin and death and hell, and they can't do anything about it. That's the truth. They're not a decision-making individual at all. They're dead. They're perishing. Lazarus does not need to make a good decision. He just needs to hear the voice of Christ, doesn't he? Yeah. If we don't preach to, we won't, we won't preach to Lazaruses. Instead, we'll preach to Hercules. I'm doing a lot of myths, aren't I? Her Hercules, at one stage, he could go left towards vice. And there's a, there's a, a beautifully, but, but uh, kind of not, not very, um, uh, anyway, a woman who's dressed like a harlot, really. She's called Vice, and she's tempting Hercules to go that way. And then there's a very prim and proper woman called Virtue, and she's tempting Hercules to go to the Virtue side. Will, will Hercules choose Vice, or will he choose Virtue? He decides, yeah? 
and he's at the center. Do we preach to Hercules at the crossroads? Or do we preach to Lazarus in the tomb? Makes a huge difference in your evangelism. Um, if you don't preach to, behavior will take center stage. Um, because you'll try to convict people of sin in terms of what they've done. Um, what I love about the Christian Explore course is, is getting right at the heart. You know, Rico is always teaching from Mark chapter 7, out of the heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. It's just this horrible fountain coming out of our, our being. Out of our being comes our behavior. And you need to convict people about their being, not, the, not just their behavior. If you convict people about their behavior, they will, they will understand that your solution must be good behavior. If bad behavior is the problem, surely they think good behavior will be the solution. But no, your being is wrong. Therefore, you must be born again. Yeah? You must be made a new creature in Christ. Uh, if we don't preach to... Judgment will simply be later on down there. And not the hell that people feel now. Uh, in evangelism, I'm always talking to people who say, I feel cursed. I feel like I'm cursed. Um, and I say, yeah, you are. You totally are. Nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. But come to Christ. In Him, you are blessed. Totally blessed. But people feel the disconnection. They feel, they feel the suspicion and the selfishness and the slavery and the self-justification and the stuff-ups. They feel that stuff and you just sort of say, yeah, you are disconnected from God. It doesn't have to stay that way. Um, let's just quickly do one. You're one with Adam, be one with Jesus. I always preach it in terms of marriage. This is fun. Let's, let's watch this. Okay, so Adam and Kate on that lovely day. Nobody has to tell anybody why William chose Kate. I mean, it's obvious. She's a lovely girl. She's got a, a winning personality. But the, the story of the Bible is really that the Prince of Heaven marries someone a bit more like this. Um, corpse bride, okay? We're dead, you know. The Lord, the Lord comes for Lazaruses, yeah? The Lord comes for dead harlots, okay? But on that day when they get married, they make vows to each other. And what do they say? When, when, when uh, my wife and I got married, we, uh, we said these vows to each other. All that I am, I give to you. All that I have, I share with you. And uh, there were literally people laughing in the congregation because they knew we had nothing to give each other at all. Only debts. <laughs> Here, have my student loan repayments. They're yours, honey. You know, very... but, but what about this marriage? What about this marriage? When they say, all I am I give to you, all I have I share with you, his royal name, his royal power, his royal wealth go to her in an instant. And then it goes both ways, doesn't it? Because she says, all that I am I give to you, all that I have I share with you her shame, her weakness, her poverty. And this is, this is where the swap comes in. We, all, we love preaching the swap in evangelism. We love it. We love it. But it doesn't make any sense without one, without union with Christ. Why does he get zapped and she gets all the blessings? Why? Why? Oh, it makes no sense to non-Christians. That doesn't make sense to us either, unless you've got union with Christ. Because we're one with Jesus Love pays the price to be won. And so, of course, of course, the husband absorbs all the debts and shares all his wealth. Of course. If we don't preach one, people will never understand the swap. We, we love to preach the swap. We rarely preach one. We rarely preach the union that makes sense of the swap. But the best thing, and this is why we really need to preach one, union with Christ, is that the best thing she gets out of union with Christ, the best thing we get out of union with Christ, what is it? Christ, yeah? In so many gospel presentations, what are the good things you get out of, out of being saved? Well, not hell, that's good. Forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit in my life, feelings of purpose and, and that kind of thing, that's nice. But the best thing about being united to Christ is Christ, right? We don't marry him for his money. And yet how many, and this changes evangelism in, in a second. If you think evangelism is selling people a package deal, if you think, I've got a package deal to offer you, uh, escape from hell, forgiveness of sins, Holy Spirit in your life, and all for the low, low price of repentance and faith. It's all you need to do. And then you, you've suddenly got an exchange, and therefore you need salespeople. Salespeople who are really good at selling you insurance when you don't need it. 
And that's what evangelism is. It's just sharing people, in, you know, giving people insurance when they do need it. Fire insurance from the last day. And you need, therefore, evangelists need to be a strange breed of marketeer who are really, really good with words. But what if, what if it's just oneness with Jesus? And what we offer is Christ himself. John Wesley, George Whitfield, the, the number one phrase they use to describe their evangelism. At the end of the hard day's evangelism, they just said, I offered them Christ. That's it. That's what we're doing. I offered them Christ. And you don't need to be a good salesperson to offer them Christ. Because you know Jesus. Can't you speak of Jesus to somebody else? You know him. You don't know everything about the Bible. You don't know everything about how the gospel fits together. But you know him. You can offer him, can't you? You can say to people, that's what I love about Jesus. 